This afternoon, I'm going to talk about China's economy and, in particular, the role of the financial system in that economy. If you have questions as we go along, then please just raise your hand and, and ask them. At the end, I'll also have a dedicated period for questions. So last October, a number of uh, international organizations, the IMF, the World Bank, announced that China became the largest economy in the world in terms of purchasing power parity. Now, first of all, I should explain what that means. If you go to China, many things are very cheap there if you think about them in terms of pounds or dollars or euros. And what economists do to try and adjust for these price level differences is to come up with translations in purchasing power parity terms. So you're changing the unit so that each unit, roughly speaking, buys the same real basket of goods. Now, <clears throat> that's obviously a wonderful achievement. Uh, if you go back uh, 30, 40 years, China's economy was a small fraction of the U.S. economy. So the fact that it's now become the largest in the world is a tremendous achievement. Now, of course, in recent quarters, China's economy has been slowing down. So uh, a few years ago, it was growing 10, 11, 12 percent. And the first quarter of this year, it grew at 7 percent on an annual basis. And that's the slowest since the crisis. And if you look at the paper from yesterday, for example, you will see, again, they're thinking that it may slow down a little bit from that going forward. That's still a very high growth rate, but not as high as it's been. Now, one of the problems is that as the growth rate slows down, Chinese companies will have much less retained earnings, which they can plow back to allow them to invest and grow more. And so the financial system is going to play an increasingly important role in the growth of China. And that's why it's so important that the reforms that the Chinese government has been discussing for some time now are implemented as quickly as possible because that will enable the growth to either go up or not go down as much. So the question is, what are those financial reforms that are needed to make sure that China can keep growing and be such an important part of the global economy that it's becoming? Now, I want to start with a review of where China's economy is. Now, what this table shows is the largest 15 economies in the world in terms of GDP and growth. Now, if we look in this first column, I should point out, these are GDP in 2013. The 2014 numbers are coming out about now, but we haven't had time to incorporate them yet. So these are the largest 15 economies in 2013, just using market exchange rates. And what you can see is that the U.S. is way out in front at $16.8 trillion. Then we have China a long way behind at about $9.2 trillion. Japan is number three at $4.9 trillion. Now, if you remember, China only overtook Japan a few years ago to become the second biggest economy. But what you can see here is that it's already almost half the size. So China has really overtaken it and 
blown past it in terms of market exchange rates. Of course, a large part of that is the fact that the yen has weakened so much over the last couple of years. As we go down, then we get the large European economies, Germany, France, the UK, then Brazil and Russia, Italy, number 10 is India, and so on down the list. Now, I think this is how many people think about the world today. The U.S. is just the biggest economy by far. European economies are also very significant, and China is there, but it's not huge. Now, my own view is that this is a better representation of the way the world used to be, and that this second column, which is GDP in this purchasing power parity terms, is a much better representation of the way the world is. Now, what you can see is that, at least in 2013, the U.S. was number one, but China was very close behind. And, of course, what happened in 2014, China kept growing at a fairly high rate of around 7.3 or 4%, and the U.S. was much lower growth at 2-point-something growth. So China, by the end of the year, was able to overtake the U.S. and become the largest economy. Now, if those kinds of trends continue, the world is going to be a very different place. So uh, in maybe 10 years, it'll be half as big again. In 20 or 30 years, it may be twice the size of the U.S. economy. So it's going to be a very different world going forward if these growth rates continue, which, of course, is, is uh, always possible that they, that won't happen. Now, the next big change is that India moves up from being a very small in terms of dollars, but a very significant in terms of purchasing power parity. It's already the third largest economy, and... Uh, significantly larger than Japan. And this is why we hear so much about China and India, because these are, in many ways, going probably to be the economies of the future. As we go down, we get Japan at number four, then Germany. And what we can see is that Russia and Brazil move up somewhat. This is the other two, along with South Africa, that are in the BRICS economy, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And also in PPP terms, you can see they're much more significant. Then we get France, Indonesia, UK, and so on down the list. This is the way the world is today, I would argue. That's a much better representation of economic reality and economic strength. Now, the third is growth rates. And what you can see is these are growth rates from 1990 to 2013. They're adjusted for inflation, so these are real growth rates. What you can see is that China is just way out in front. It's been growing at 9.9% for those 23 years. And that's why it's been able to do so well and to overtake the U.S., because this is a phenomenally high growth rate. Number two is Vietnam, which is also doing very well, 6.9%. But Vietnam is a much poorer country. And the poorer you are, the greater the potential for growth by just taking on technologies from other parts of the world. Uh, as we go down, what we see is India is next at 6.3%, and we've got Angola and so on down the list. Now, two countries which I'll be talking more about in a minute, which are very interesting ones, are Korea and Taiwan, China. Both of these countries have very high growth rates still. And the reason that's so interesting is that in 1950, both were roughly the equivalent in terms of GDP per capita as Ghana in Africa. So they were at African levels. Taiwan was somewhat higher than Korea, 
but both were very poor countries. Now, you may wonder, why do I have Taiwan, China? Well, people in China regard Taiwan as being part of China. And when uh, Chiang Kai-shek first took the Kuomintang there in 1949 with the liberation, they also viewed Taiwan as part of China. Today, it's still called the Republic of China. Now, that's going to be important because for a large part of its history, it was indeed definitely part of China. Now, <clears throat> if we adjust for per capita growth, many of these countries are growing quickly in terms of their overall economy because the population's growing. Population grows, you expect the size of the economy to grow. Now, <clears throat> what you can see is that China is still number one by far. Because of the one-child policy, its population hasn't been growing very much for some time now. Vietnam is still number two, but its growth rate falls to 5.6%. India is still uh, number three. It's at 4.6%, significantly below this 6.3% uh, that we had in the unadjusted column. Now, as we go down, what you can see is that Korea and Taiwan rank quite highly up there. And they've been growing at these rates for many, many years now. Now, as we go down, uh, what we can see is that the only European country is Poland in that list. That's been growing at 3.6% in real terms and doing very well in those terms. Now, I would argue that these two columns represent the future because these are the countries that are growing and they'll become a larger and larger part of the global economy. Now, one of the important questions is, well, if countries or places like Korea and Taiwan have been growing at these high rates for such a long time, where have they got in terms of GDP per capita? Because that's where, ultimately, we're interested in, at least in many dimensions. Now, what we've done in this list is look at GDP per capita in PPP terms. And I should stress we've left out small countries. So the richest country in the world is actually Qatar. And Qatar has lots of oil and not many people. So their GDP per capita is something like 88,000 in 2013. Number two is Luxembourg. Luxembourg has very few people and lots of financial services. So they are also high GDP. As you go down the list, there are other places like Singapore, Hong Kong, and so on. But if we leave out these small countries, what we can see is the U.S. is number one still. Saudi Arabia is number two. And that was, of course, when oil was still at very high levels. Australia, the Netherlands, traditionally the, the rich, one of the richest European countries, Canada, Germany. And then what you can see is Taiwan comes in just behind Germany, but ahead of Belgium, France, and the UK. And in fact, Taiwan overtook France and the UK two, three years ago. So this is a country that's gone from African levels in 1950 to northern European levels 60 years later. And 60 years is not that long. If you think this week we were celebrating VE Day, which is 70 years ago. So you can go from being a poor country at African levels to northern European levels in 60, 65 years. Now, as we keep going down, France, Japan, the UK, Italy, what you can see is Korea is at southern European levels. Now, as I said, it was even poorer than Taiwan in 1950, but it's got to the southern European levels 
in 65 years. So I think that's, that's a very important observation. Now, if we look at countries that have been successful over the long term, three of them stand out. Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. These are the countries that have had very high growth rates for decades on end. Now, Japan, after the Second World War, grew very fast, basically up until 1990. Now, Japan, I would argue, is a special case. After the Meiji Restoration at the end of the 19th century, it imported a lot of Western technology and grew fast at the beginning of the 20th century. By the 1930s, it had some of the most sophisticated military technology in the world. So many people argue the Zero Aircraft was one of the best aircraft in the world. So it was a sophisticated country. During the war, the Americans basically flattened Japanese industry, had enormous numbers of bombing raids, and destroyed the physical capacity. But a large extent of the human capital, which is what's really important for the economy, was saved. And so it was able to grow because of that, I would argue. Of course, in 1990, the bubble burst in, in the property markets, and it's been fairly slow growing since then. Now, as I said, the two that are very interesting are South Korea and Taiwan. So people often argue, well, if, if China just made lots of reforms and so on and became much more like a Western economy and had rule of law and got rid of corruption and so on, then it would do even better. But it's, it's important to point out, pretty much no country has really done better. Some countries have done, at least in the long run, somewhat similarly well. Do you have a question? Okay, now... Where, where, where does China rank relative to those? So what we've done here is look at Korea and Taiwan from 1960. So we put them both at 1 or 100%. And then what we've done is put China at 1980. So South Korea is blue, Taiwan is red, China in 20 years is green. And what you can see is basically they're indistinguishable. At the end, China's going a little bit higher, but what we're seeing is these are countries which have grown about 20 times since 1960, which is 50 years ago. So what I think that shows is it's not inconceivable that China in 20 or 30 years can not only be the largest economy in the world, but it can also be at southern or even possibly northern European levels in terms of GDP per capita. Now, that's a, a, obviously a very uh, strong prediction and may well not happen, but it could happen. Now, one of the big differences, of course, between China and these two places is that they're relatively small. So South Korea has a population around 60 million, so it's about the same size as in, in that dimension as the UK. Uh, Taiwan is a lot smaller. It has about 20, 23 million, I believe. So much bigger than a city, but still uh, not too big. China, of course, has the largest population in the world still at about 1.3-something uh, billion, so it's a huge country in terms of population. What that means is if it grows at these high rates for many years to come, we're going to see some of the strains that we've already seen in terms of commodity prices and so on. So that may stop the growth. But on the other hand, if we move towards technological development of the kind that you can see all around you as you walk around the Imperial Festival, those kinds of things can be overcome, and maybe they can do it. Now, a big part of any growth is going to be how do you save and how do you invest? 
And what I want to talk about is the four main ways that Chinese are able to save, which is banks, financial markets, real estate, and what is often referred to as the shadow banking system. Now, most savings in China go into banks. And what you can see from this graph is that returns on bank accounts are very negative on average, particularly in the 1990s. So you would get rates of 10 12 13%, but this was at a time when inflation there was at 25 30%. So the actual negative return, the negative real return, in some years reached minus 25 on some of these accounts. So we had a very negative there, but even if you look in the last 10, 20 years, most accounts give you a negative return in real terms. So if you save in China, you're not accumulating wealth. You're basically keeping it the same or having it shrink. Now, how is the economy doing so well? Well, what's happened is that if you compare the blue, which is the state-owned enterprises, and the listed sector, which are mostly formal SOEs, you can see around late 90s, they were roughly the same. But the red, which is the private sector and local government-owned firms, which are, we would argue, more like private-owned firms. They're not run by the central government with the central government's d different objective function. They've grown much, much more rapidly, and they've become roughly two-thirds of the economy. Now... The same is true with employment. So the part of the economy in China which is very dynamic is the private and the local government owned, but increasingly private. Now, the problem is that banks don't lend to them. The banks usually lend to state-owned enterprises and listed firms. And so the banks are not in the right place. They're not lending to the good parts of the economy. And that's my own view as to why this slowdown is likely to continue unless we can reform and get more funds into the private companies. Now, interest rates in China are still, to some extent, regulated. They've been deregulated to a large extent, but we need to complete that. Uh, and the, as I say, the banks need to start lending much more to the private parts of the economy and less to the state-owned enterprise and listed firms. And I think there needs to be a lot more competition in the sector. And in particular, we need a lot more foreign banks to enter and start competing with them and driving up returns to depositors. Financial markets. So we see hear a lot about financial markets in China. Stock market in particular has been booming recently. But if you look at the long term, China's stock market has not done very well. And other markets are still at an early stage. This is a comparison of the main economies. The blue is bank assets. The green is the private bond market, so corporate bonds and financial institutions and non-financial. The red is stock market capitalization, and the purple is uh, bond markets for public securities, treasuries, and so on. So Germany is very much a bank-based system, and then it's stock market and bond market and public bond market are all reasonable, but nothing like the banks. UK, because it's an international banking sector, has a lot of banking assets. The stock market is also quite important. But the bond market is not very important. Corporate bonds are mostly for financial institutions, and there's very little in terms of non-financial institutions.
The U.S. has much more balance. Banks are much less important. Stock market and bond markets are very important there. Japan, very much a bank-based economy. And, of course, it also has a very large public bond market. China, as I said, is very much a bank-based economy. The stock market is becoming increasingly important. Bond markets are growing, as we'll see. It has a relatively small public bond market. If you look at the other BRICS economy, they are more balanced in terms of banks and markets. Bond markets in the private sector don't matter that much, and public bond markets are not that important. So China is mostly about banks, but markets are becoming important. If you look at growth, what you can see if we do it from 1991, when the stock markets were founded, China's just way outperformed other countries. This is the same as the table. It's a slightly different way. Its GDP has grown by about eight and a half times. If we look at India, it's number two. Other countries haven't grown very much at all. If we look at stock markets, though, China had a big run-up in the mid-2000s, but if you go back to 2013, it wasn't much different than it was in 1991. So even though GDP is growing incredibly, stock market hasn't done very well. It's about last year, 2014, 2015 beginning, it's done much better. But in the long run, it's not done well. The country that's done really well, actually, is Brazil. If you put your money in Brazil, you would have done much better than other places. Uh, the red is the US S&P 500. Uh, the gray is um, the Sensex in India. So India's done pretty well, too. Japan has not done well, and you won't be surprised that Russia hasn't done very well at all. So one of the questions is, how can the fastest-growing economy have such an underperforming stock market relative to the rest of the world? And that's a very interesting and important question. Now... <clears throat> One problem is that when companies are listed in China, if you look on their return on assets, so how the real side of the company is doing, you can see that before listing, this date zero is listing, what happens is it goes up, so they do lots of things to make the company grow and have positive income and have high return on assets. But then when it lists, that collapses, and it does very poorly. That happens in some countries to some extent, so in Brazil somewhat similar, but nothing like as much. In most countries, there isn't this big drop after listing. So that's one big issue. Why does that happen? Now, the next thing is that uh, what we can see is that delisting is a much more traumatic event in China. In most countries, if a firm stops performing, it's simply delisted. It may go bankrupt or maybe taken over, but it stops. In China, there's a great reluctance to delist. There's a, still very much a mindset that if you put money into stocks and you put 100 yuan, for example, you're owed 100 yuan by the company. And so if you delist it, it's a recognition that you're never going to get your money back. And so there's a big reluctance for the authorities to delist stock. So that's a part of this puzzle, but we're still working on why, Japanese, uh, sorry, why Chinese stocks have so underperformed. In terms of other markets, if you look at public debt market, it's a reasonable size. 30% of GDP, roughly, for central government debt. The corporate debt market is growing fast. That's becoming a very important market in China. The insurance sector is still a very early stage of de development because under uh, the communist regime before it started liberalizing, what you had was that the firms you worked for, which were centrally government-owned or local government-owned, you had insurance provided there weren't many insurance companies at all. But that's growing 
fast. And then pension and mutual funds again at an early stage. And one of the big problems in Chinese markets is there aren't that many institutional investors. There are a lot of individuals, but not many institutional. And that makes the markets much more susceptible manipulation and some of these other problems. So the other big problem is that most of the firms that are listed, as I said earlier, were formerly state-owned enterprises, and that isn't the dynamic part of the, of the economy. So we need to have more listed firms that are these dynamic companies. We need to have a bigger public bond market uh, with a full yield curve, and we need to have um, the corporate bond market continue to develop. And large institutional investors should be encouraged too. Real estate, you hear a lot about property in China. And what you can see here in a minute is this big issue, is there a bubble? And the government, sorry, the government uh, put in place a number of measures to stop overheating, and they've had some success, as we'll see. Now, if you look at China as a whole, We've shown it in this graph. Now, just to explain these graphs, we've started at 100 in 2002, December 2002. The red dots are disposable income per capita. And they give a reference. You wouldn't be too surprised if real estate prices grew at the same rate as GDP per capita, disposable GDP per capita. The blue are housing prices. Now, housing prices are notoriously difficult to measure. They're very volatile in China, so we've taken six months' averages. These are not government data. It's a private data service. As I say, in any country, they're problematic. In China, they're probably problematic, too. This is Beijing. And what you can see is that back in the early 2000s, house prices went up along with disposable income. And then they took off relative to that. And then during the stimulus package, they went up to about four times where they were. Then they fell back, and now they're back along with income. So arguably, there was a significant bubble in Beijing, but the government has done something to control that. If you look in Guangzhou, you can see not nearly as much. It's been growing in line with income until the stimulus package, and then it went up and stayed up somewhat. Shanghai, similar story to Beijing. It took off in the, in the uh, stimulus package period after the crisis, and then was reined back in. And then finally, Shenzhen, which is the city near Hong Kong, which is very affected by Hong Kong's property market. You can see that's a completely different world than the other ones. Hong Kong property has gone through the roof, mainly with mainland money, many people argue. And so Shenzhen has followed that somewhat. So real estate, there's some evidence there were bubbles. Some people believe that particularly in high-end property, there still are bubbles there. Uh, the macroprudential policies the government adopted, restricting second mortgages, things like that, have had some success. I think one of the problems in China is that local public finance is still too reliant on sales of land. And that is, makes it very different. They don't have taxing authority. They don't get block grants in the same way as in many other countries. That needs to be reformed. Let me just finish up with the Chinese shadow banking system, and then we'll turn uh, to questions. Not much in, is known about the operation of this sector. It seems to play an important role, and we need to understand it better. This is uh, a study from uh, uh, Moody's, which based on a number of data sets, but they, are, they argue that this is uh, 
maybe 40 to 50 percent of GDP in terms of the size of the assets in the shadow banking sector. Consists of lots of different things. It's very different from shadow banking sector in the US or the UK or Europe. Here it's uh, bankers' acceptances, entrusted loans, which are loans from firms to firms. It's wealth management products, which are brokered, but they're usually typically from firms to, to individuals. The banks don't have them on their balance sheet. They're just paid a, a fee. Uh, informal lending is still a big chunk, 12%, trust loans, and so on around the pie chart. I think there's a, a sense that shadow banking systems are problematic because they're not regulated. Uh, my own view is that in China, what the shadow banking system is doing is filling the void for the companies that the banking system isn't reaching. Banks don't give you much return. Stock market traditionally hasn't given you much return in the long run. A lot of money went into real estate. That's why they shot up. But that's now fallen back. And so what people are doing is looking for alternatives. That's what the shadow banking system is providing. If you look at some of the rates that are paid, it's not uncommon for firms to pay 15 20% on these kinds of loans. That isn't default risk because default to a large extent in China is still rare. And what that represents is that these firms have very good projects. And this is the sense in which China still, in my view, has great growth potential. If you could get money to those firms, they could grow very fast and the economy could start growing again. The government's done a very good job of arguing that now growth is slower but more sustainable. My own view is that if we could just get the financial sector to work properly, it could start growing at higher growth rates again. Uh, one of the other big reforms is the RMB as a reserve currency. China has enormous foreign exchange reserves. One of the interesting things over the last year is or so is that they've been going down. They peaked at about 3.99 trillion. They're down to about 3.73. Uh, that potentially has big effects on the global financial system because many of that is invested in US and European markets. One of the big issues has been in the long run is the RMB undervalued or overvalued the Americans argued for a long time that it was undervalued, that they were keeping it down. What we've seen over the last year is it's actually been rising significantly. And that's one of the very interesting questions. The real issue is what will happen with the capital account. Now, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone was put in place to try out lots of reforms and start opening up China's financial system to the world. So one of the big ones was, what's capital account convertibility going to do to the Chinese economy? The moment they have very strong capital controls, money can't very easily go in or come out. But if China normalizes and becomes an open economy in terms of the capital account, that's going to change. The Shanghai Free Trade Zone has, as one of its main purposes, trying to find out how that's going to operate. We have other things, the interest rate liberalization that we talked about, cross-border usage of RMB. Looks like the RMB is going to join the US dollar, the euro, the pound as part of the special drawing rights. And then opening up to uh, foreign institutions and allowing Chinese financial institutions to develop offshore overseas expertise. So, as I say, I think reforms are very important in China. It would be great if they could be speeded up because we could then potentially reverse this growth slowdown. I think growth will continue. It may be slower in the past, but 
it has the potential to keep going for many years, as we've seen with Korea and Taiwan. And China will continue to become more important globally and dominate the global economic and financial system, in my view. Let me stop there. I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has them individually, too.